the contribution element will come out in the regulations which are out for public participation currently. So we cannot speak with authority in mm -hmm. terms of what will be the eventual outcome. But what has been proposed has been the 2.75% of, uh, of your income. Salary. And not mm -hmm. essentially salaries. Mm -hmm. This will be 2.7% of your income. Not um, to sound controversial uh, and to go both ways. Huh? I uh, personally, I think the initiative to uh, social health insurance is a good initiative. What are the components of the Social Health Insurance Act? Because then it's not the fund, is it? Yeah, what yeah. are the components of the Social Health Insurance Act? So the health um, facilities, so to speak, um, were divided into um, six, so to speak, which includes level one, which means at the community level, meaning that your house, if uh, someone gives you... Um, a painkiller in your house that is termed level one. And then depending on the um, amount, the kind of services that you can receive at that facility, then a facility is termed as level two to six. Karibu to the One Health Lens podcast. I am Dr. Diana. And I am Dr. Simon Moshara Kigondu. In this podcast, we talk about everything health, from health matters, global perspectives, and the road to universal health coverage. And today in the studio, we have Dr. Elizabeth Kitao, a new mom, and she'll be telling us about that. We will be talking about universal health coverage in the headlines on January 22nd, 2024, the Daily Nation read, SHIF, Race Against Time to Craft Rules for New Health Cover. And in it, we're really seeing regulations do not necessarily require the approval of parliament before they become operational. But the big factor is that at some point, we rolled out universal health coverage. Then there was a ban. Then it's been lifted. What's really happening? There were bills, there were laws, there was a ban. Something is happening. And all Kenyans are worried about how is it going to affect their pockets. But Dr. Elizabeth Gitao, maybe you start by introducing yourself. Um, thank you, Diana. Uh, my name is Dr. Elizabeth Gitao Mine. I'm a medical doctor. I uh, work in um, the area of health systems and health policy with a big focus on health financing. Additionally, in the policy space, I also sit as the Assistant Secretary General at the Kenya Medical Association and as the CEO of Kenya Association of Private Hospitals. How's the new baby doing? She's fine. She's fine. I'm a new old mom. I have <laughs> exactly. other babies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. 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 Maybe let's start with universal health coverage and the four bills, right? What were the four bills that were passed last year? And maybe take a step by step. This was bill number one, two, three, four, and what it meant really. Um, really in no particular order, probably there were four bills. The first one which essentially focused on the public uh, sector was the FIF bill. That is the Facility Improvement Fund uh, Act now. Let me call it an act because it's signed. Um, it was supposed to support healthcare facilities to be able to retain the income that they get from either whether it's NHIF or from the out of pocket that people pay when they come to the facilities. So essentially, according to the PFM Act in Kenya, it means that every funds collected must go into the county uh, into the county pot. Uh, so essentially the facilities could not utilize any money they collect. So the F5 bill basically supports the implementation of um, facilities being able to utilize their funds, making them more efficient uh, to be able to buy supplies when and if they need. Okay. Um, the second one was the Primary Health Care Act. Uh, basically, that one is to organize um, our our delivery of the health services. So basically maps out various um, health uh, service delivery units from the community all the way to level one, two, and, and basically links them all the way to bigger facilities. So there'll be a referral system. There'll be a way in which uh, somebody is able to um, be served in the community. There is also engagement between the public sector facilities and the private sector facilities so in essence uh, they want to organize the health sector delivery into one under the leadership of the Ministry of Health mm -hmm. 
um the other bill uh, and and which is bringing before i talk about the shif was a digital healthcare bill uh basically that one being a digital economy essentially we've uh, suffered in the healthcare sector with lack of data and lack of organization and lack of a health management information system, which basically is able to document the patient journey all the way from the community when you're doing a wellness all the way to the referral system. And also you as a citizen being able to have your health records in one place, which are transferable from one place to another. And again, that data can be utilized into, uh, into research, can be utilized into making decisions for health policy and health system strengthening. And then now the, the last, <laughs> yes. which is quite controversial, yeah. is the Social Health uh, Act, Social Health Insurance Act, which basically now is the one which comes to enable these other three bills uh, in ensuring that the health sector is financed. What are the components of the Social Health Insurance Act? Because then it's not the fund, is it? Yeah, what yeah. are the components of the Social Health Insurance Act? So the Social Health Insurance Act creates a social health authority, which essentially will have three funds. The three funds will have the emergency and chronic illness funds. You will have the primary health care fund, and now you'll have the social health insurance fund. So uh, the one which is most controversial is the social health insurance fund because that one is contributory. Mm -hmm. The other two uh, funds are supposed to be tax funded by the uh, by mm -hmm. the government. So if you're accessing health services from level uh, two and three and below, which is uh, basically meant to be primary health care, that one should be funded by government. Or for instance, if you get an accident um, and you need support, that will be funded by government or certain things such as dialysis or so might be funded by government. This one you have access to whether you're a paid up member or not. As long as you're a Kenyan uh, living in this country, you should be able to access this. Mm. The social health insurance fund is the one that is controversial, which means that every Kenyan has to contribute. Mm -hmm. And the ones who are not able to contribute, there are mechanisms mm. through the uh, social protection to be able to support them. To, uh, to be paid for by government into the social health insurance. Okay, maybe let's even just pause there because Dr. Tao mentioned something like level two, level three. In your experience, Dr. Kigondu, what's, what's the differentiation? Maybe mm -hmm. someone's listening, they're saying, I mean, I go to a hospital, level two, level three, and why the need to separate into one, two, and three? Yeah, or the different elements, yeah. So the health um, facilities, so to speak, um, were divided into uh, six, so to speak, which includes level one, which means at the community level, meaning that your house, if uh, someone gives you um, a painkiller in your house, that is termed level one. And then depending on the um, amount, the kind of services that you can receive at that facility, then a facility is termed as level two to six. Uh, simply meaning that uh, six is the highest. You can get um, all uh, services, uh, especially the specialized services. Those, that's a level six facility. Uh, an example would be Kenyatta National Hospital, Moi Teaching Referral Hospital. A level two is the dispensary, where you may get the basic, uh, services like you can get some uh, minor treatments and uh, some dispensaries you may get uh, for instance in the obstetrics and gynecology field they can conduct deliveries but if they get complications then they would need to refer now to the next level for facility so generally just looking at it um, county and sub-county hospitals would be at level four and then you have some uh, bigger hospitals at level five and then you have the health center so the um, human resources complement would be that um, um, traditionally you would find the um, um, level two may be headed by a nurse level three may be headed by a clinical officer level four uh, and five and six, then the doctors come in with uh, the rest of the staff complement there. Okay, so going back to the element of one is contributory, one is meant to be provided for by the government, right? 
So maybe let's start with the contributory because that's the one everyone is aware of, right? Okay, let's break it down. What's the contributory element? Um, and even before we get to that, right? Why, why the division, right? Why is it that there's one where only what you're contributing to, if I'm contributing the, what I'm hearing is 2.75%, right? Why that versus the other? And it's that element of social protection. Why was there first a division into this one? Uh, people will contribute, there's other that will be more uh, funded by government. Um, so essentially, you're looking at as to various models of uh, financing healthcare. Mm. So you can finance healthcare in various models, including out of pocket where people pay for themselves, um, including insurance, which is now the, f the now the contributory schemes, and now you also have now the tax funded. So you look at equity, uh, and also you look at access. So by providing primary health care, the government is looking at access so that everyone has access, whether you've paid into the SHIF, whether you've not, and also in terms of equity so that everybody is able to access. And basically in terms of continuity, if you're able to deal with uh, the health sector at the primary health care level, it actually has um, benefits in oh. terms of reducing the entry of people into the uh, into the healthcare system with complications. So in terms of the emergency and chronic uh, fund, essentially uh, it's a risky, it's mm. a risky fund. Um, and also in terms of the actuarial of it, it's mm. actually quite unpredictable. Yeah. So, and I think that is why I would presume the government thought it would be good to actually fund it uh, from from the tax coffers so that you're able to pay for it even as you figure out how much does it cost because essentially we we possibly don't have much in terms of how much it costs yep. and remember also in terms of access to health services whether you're a paid up member or not when you get an accident nobody even possibly knows your name and etc to be able to get that and you should be treated in any uh, in any facility mm. based on the Healthcare Act of 2017, you should actually get services from any hospital when you're in an emergency. However, we have had challenges where we've never had an emergency fund that has been mm. allocated by the cabinet secretary. So I, I presume this is a step in the right direction that we have an emergency fund. So whether you're a paid up person or not, mm. you should be able to access those services. So long as those days that you'd get an emergency and then you're starting to sell off title deeds and whatnot, just because you've gotten into an accident and perhaps a hospital will not admit you without any funding. Is that the essence so of it? I, I see that as a vision of mm. this new act. In terms of implementation, I think that is where the rubber meets the road. Mm. We want to see how it will be implemented to be able to do that. Yeah, Because then before then, with NHIF, everything was under one roof, right? There's no distinction in terms of primary. Maybe they might have been for renal and other sort of medical cases or specialty, but there's no differentiation, right? So everything in NHIF was mostly contributory. Uh -huh. There was no particular um, tax funded. Apart from the schemes which were government funded, like Linda Mama, Edward. Uh -huh for the students however the government was contributing on behalf of those individuals so essentially there was nowhere within the nhif act which actually provided for tax funded mechanisms directly mm. so that means with this new act then the edu affairs the rest linda mamas are scrapped yes uh, as it is they yes. are not in existence especially edwafia which lapsed in december yeah. and i'm sure you've seen some of the um complaints within social media about edwafia mm -hmm. so sha will not have any managed schemes mm. so it will have one scheme for everybody in yeah. the country and essentially for us within the health sector what we are concerned about and what we want to see is what benefits package comes out because now that will apply to all kenyans okay so we've covered uh Again, Social Health Insurance Act has primary health care fund, the emergency fund, and now we're going to the Social Health Insurance Fund, which is what's grabbing the headlines, right? And this is the contributory element, right? Maybe speak, before we go to Kigondo, maybe speak about the contribution element. What's, what's the uh, uh, contribution, right? Um, 2.7, um, yes. So the contribution element will come out in the regulations which are out for public participation currently. 
So we cannot speak with authority in mm-hmm. terms of what will be the eventual outcome. But what has been proposed has been the 2.75 percent of uh, of your income salary, and not mm-hmm. essentially salaries. Mm-hmm. This will be 2.7 percent of your income. Please remember that any child usually would would go um, to salaried individuals, but in this particular case, we are going to be as the government is going to be asking you. Mm-hmm. to actually estimate your income and you'll contribute 2.7 percent, 2.75% of that. So whether you're in informal sector, so we have not been getting money from informal sector. Mm-hmm. Uh, going forward, we shall be having a mechanism within which to determine your income so that you get the 2.75% from all Kenyans who are able to pay. Mm. And the ones who, like, um, in terms of their income, I, I, I foresee there being an uh, a base income where the president, I think, has been had mentioning of the amount of 300 Mm-hmm. So this 300 possibly will come with a base income. For instance, if you earn 20 and below, probably you'll pay 300. Uh, if if they're depending on what they agree upon, but that mm-hmm. is a new new change. How they are going to mandate people in the informal sector is it's what a, it's a challenge. Yeah, and this is where experience comes in. So Dr. Kigondo, right? So as she rightfully said, it's proposed, right? There are regulations that must now enforce this or that are being, you know, uh, public participation. Maybe talk us through what that means, right? If I'm seated on this other end and I'm hearing regulations, they must go regulations. As far as I'm concerned as an average Kenyan, a bill has been pa- uh, passed into law. That's it. What's that process regulation? Where does public participation comes in? Where will uh, the minister come in? What are those stages that it will undergo that perhaps at the end of this month or next month, as the case might be, will be saying, okay, whether I'm employed, whether I'm not em- employed, at a minimum, I'll have to contribute, say, the 300. What's that process like? Yeah. So the... Um, so Prior to passing the act, the so, uh, social health insurance, there was a bill. A bill means that it's debated in parliament, then becomes an act. An act is now law. So prior to that, the uh, government uh, proposed what they wanted to do and uh, called for what is called public participation. Public participation essentially means you, anyone, can give uh, their views on what they think uh, should happen on what has been tabled. After the act was passed, an act is the framework. It does not uh, give specifics exactly. After the act, now you have to operationalize the law. And uh, what does that mean? Um, That means that now um, at the Ministry of Health level, they have to write the regulations how we will operationalize the act. And these are now what are called the regulations that are supposed to be, uh, it's the proposal of how we want to operationalize this. And then that is now at this stage, is in the stage of uh, public participation, which means that anyone and uh, the associations are actually drafting uh, what they think about it and I'm sure unions and also interested individuals. So if we use for instance the um, uh, 2.75% that had been proposed or we've been hearing about it, it's not necessarily what has been proposed then uh, some um, people in public participation may propose that uh, uh, to cap it for instance if it's to be there. Others may actually propose that it's be deleted you see, mm. so it is up to you to make proposals. Then once they have uh, these proposals on the regulations have gone in, then the ministry will now gazette um, the regulations. And these are what will be used to operationalize uh, the act. Mm. Okay. So do we have a sense of what that timeline is? Just do we have a sense of what typically that would, uh, how long it would take? Because people are worried that deductions are happening starting this month. Yet from what I'm hearing from this end is that, hey, we're deducting money, but we have no operational you know, guidance of why this money is going to go to, how it's going to be utilized, or all this is going to come after uh, the regulations have been passed. We just have the fund there. So um, these activities start after the Cabinet Secretary of Health gazettes mm-hmm. the regulations. 
uh, just to give you an easier example for instance the Kenya Medical Practitioners Dentist Council rates of doctors charges were gazetted by um, the uh, uh, cabinet secretary and that's when they take effect so these regulations currently um, they are receiving suggestions from the public and mm -hmm. everyone else on what they should be and then once they are finalized then they will be put in a gazette notice and uh, once that gazette notice is out then operationalization of the same uh, will uh, occur okay maybe back to you dr Geta, because i heard you mention a few concerns right that you might have or even the larger medical fraternity and different stakeholders you sit in policy fields technical committees what are some of those issues that people are concerned about right um maybe list them expand on them what are the issues right and which uh the common monarchy also need to be concerned about um, so I think the what will be concerning to all Kenyans will be the benefits that you accrue from being um, in this particular um, fund. So, for instance, um, currently you know that if you pay into NHIF, you'll get dialysis, you'll get surgery, and certain other things. And cert other things are not covered, yeah? So what we are looking at is this benefits package. What will it cover? What will it not cover? Will it cover everything? So that is a big point of concern such that for the person who's paying 2.75% uh, of their income, are they actually accruing benefits that will uh, make them see that this 2.75% percent is actually worth it um, the other concern of course comes from uh, civil servants they are wondering now that they'll be no longer managed schemes what would usually, what would actually happen to them the other concern is also on transition coming from the provider's perspective we have contractual agreements with NHIF we have a way in which we process our claims so as we move into the SHA what changes how fast will it change that it will not compromise the delivery of healthcare services so and also now in terms of the financing mechanism will the government be able to actually honor the amounts that they're actually committing to because mm. funding the primary health care in totality and also putting money in the emergency and chronic illness will actually take a significant amount. So will the money meet what they're promising? Mm. I mean, you've brought out very key points, right? Uh, one, I think people don't necessarily mind paying for something that they know they're going to get benefits. It's clear that if I'm paying two points. 300 whatever amount it is right and it's justified that this is the amount then it's i'm going to be able to walk in and be able to get one two three that's not yet clear mm -hmm. also on the other end i like what you said from a provider perspective it has to be clear because the issue sometimes is that people patients walk into hospitals then you come through the wall the brick wall where facilities turning you around and saying, turning your way rather, and saying we can't provide for, uh, services or you'll have to pay say a thousand, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the patient always knew that this is free, right? Mm -hmm. And so in terms of just voicing and bringing out this concern and going back to Dr. Kikondo in your experience, right? Mm -hmm. What exactly is happening in this vital um, time, right? Because if this is not aired out, if this is not captured, and it's gazetted, right? Then we come at a head because then patients already require the services. What, what's been done right now? What have you heard is happening outside there? What to address these concerns? Yeah, so the, the three pillars of universal health coverage uh, include health services, the delivery itself. You're unwell, go to the health facility, you get treated. The second one, after you get treated, is healthcare financing. Who pays for it? And does that payment uh, kill you, literally? Mm. Does it make you so poor as a result of that treatment that now you actually uh, seek from <laughs> lack of <laughs> any ability yeah. to survive? Mm. And finally, governance. So those are the three things that uh, we need to look at when we are looking at this system. So a lot of the noise you may hear is uh, coming um, and, and, and this um, social health um, insurance fund will, will face um, some uh, form of resistance from two things. We say it about the health service. I'll use a typical civil servant cover. Health service delivery, they paid a certain amount of money and they received a certain level standard of care yeah 
And now, what was the financing? The financing was that over and above the NHIF fee that they paid, their medical allowance was actually given to NHIF as a premium to add on to already mandatory deducted NHIF. And finally, on governance, is that the money that NHIF were used to pay for that service and a lot of civil servants, if I may use that because it's very easy and I've lived it, so to speak, then what? So now you come to a social health uh, insurance, insurance. Yep. which uh, not only doubles your um, um, premiums, so to speak, they've uh, given literally done a pay cut for you. And the health service that it is providing is inferior to what you used to enjoy we, when you were paying for that premium and uh, the governance of the authority you probably may have no control of it so therein lies the problem so generally all these health improvements are supposed to go parallel and um, part of the argument that the um, uh, civil servants were having is that why then don't you bring everyone to the level of the civil servant? Mm. You cannot call a civil servant privileged if just because he was receiving good care, uh, he was not only paying for it, but he, 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 uh, when they receive care. So you, you cannot, um, take, you cannot take the service level down and claim that the one who was up had a problem yeah. yeah so that's generally the argument of it so once they strengthen those three pillars mm. um healthcare service delivery which is going tandem with all the other things in, uh, increasing staff making fif uh, work mm. uh, improving the hospitals and things like that and now the financing then you put good governance then you will be on your way to uhc with less noise Fair. I mean, you could argue that, hey, uh, the whole spirit, the whole spirit of universal health coverage is exactly that. What you're saying that people will be able to enjoy uh, quality services and in your example, say, at the civil servants level, right, whereby they did have deductions and they were able to receive services, right? So then you could essentially say by then getting people to contribute and everyone to contribute that's what they're trying to do right now and and i know that uh, you've highlighted already the challenges but maybe to delve a little bit on the financing and i'll come back to you dr gitao on the financing element right specifically on that what's the challenge right okay if everyone is removing let's say 200 shillings right and you say the number of people who contribute will only be 15 percent you might know the numbers better it's a sizable chunk right so most people in a layman's perspective if you ask me i would say hey these people will have billions of shillings they should be able to provide quality care what is the issue on that financing element right because you've also hinted at the fact that are they really going to be able to sustain it? But if you're getting billions on a monthly basis, you should be, right? What, on that financing element, what's the challenge that, so, that you see? Yeah. Okay, so two challenges that I see. Um, first is on the tax-funded uh, programs, that is the emergency and the primary health care um, funds. So uh, previously, and I think we, we have seen this as a challenge where the government is trying to balance um, a lot of the needs within the country. Do they pay for SGR? Do they pay for the primary care fund? Do they even pay for the education sector? Competing so, priorities. Yeah, competing priorities. So um, in terms of what is needed to run those funds, um, if they've been thought through properly, um, I do hope that the government has a mechanism within which to sustain these funds. Mm -hmm. Remember, I think when we did the pilot um, in in some of the four counties, once it was opened up for people to access services, what happened? People who've never accessed services started coming, mm -hmm. and it became a problem to the healthcare facilities because they were not ready for the numbers of people that they were seeing. So I do hope that even in the short term, that especially for the primary health care fund, I hope they have enough uh, thought through that. Mm, the I conception see. will increase because you have increased access. 
Um, and uh, secondly, in terms of the contributory um, aspect, I think in health financing, getting the informal sector contribute and contribute on a regular basis um, is actually quite difficult. And that is why I think in part of the regulation, the Cabinet Secretary has attempted to actually say that you need to contribute annually. I think just to be able to uh, enable it? them to mm. have the money prior so that they can be able to uh, to provide the services. So I am a bit concerned. Currently, I think the insurance rate in Kenya is 18 percent. So how are we going to get to 100 percent and how are we going to effect that everybody must pay? Mm. That is the only way we're able to fund this. If people don't pay, we will not be able to achieve mm. the UHC. Okay, I'm seeing the challenge there, right? Mm. Okay, people will, a facility that used to get, say, 100 people, suddenly they will know that everything is free, you can walk in, so then it's from 100 to easily 1,000, right? And then the facility perhaps is not equipped for that, is not staffed for that, right? Then what you are having is services are not being rendered, essentially, right? Yeah. Huh. That's quite interesting. I mean, you never think about it in that way. You always think about it as, at least from a layman perspective, you never think about the planning that needs to go around that, the space and the timing, right? And essentially, even universal health coverage being a journey, right? Now, there seems to be an amount of pressure that this must start in January, February. It must start. It must start one way or the other. Um, and... I don't corner anyone, and I'll go back to Dr. Kigondu in your experience, because then NHF essentially is done, right? Um, no, you're shaking your head, <laughs> okay? Mm -hmm. um, but what, what, what happens at the end of this month? Because I know something is going to be deducted out of my paycheck. What, what do you, and again, you can't, you can really, um, as Dr. Gitao mentioned, you can only uh, propose, uh, I mean, it's a proposal right now, uh, but you can hypothesize. What, what essentially do you think is going to happen from a patient perspective, from a payer perspective, right? Not even a payer, contributor perspective. But also what happens to NHF? Any thoughts? <laughs> Too tough yeah, a question. So, and um, yeah. um, not um, to sound controversial uh, and to go both ways. Uh, I uh, personally, I think the initiative to uh, social health insurance is a good initiative. What we always differ about is the methodology. And you can see a lot of uh, the issues that are coming in terms of resistance is the methodology and the speed at which they are trying to move. Uh, traditionally, and um, you can go into history, um, you can go into history in how health reforms have occurred. And um, I happened to have been a medical superintendent at a time when uh, Kenya's major change in health policy occurred in the year 2007 to uh, 2013 where the people went back and looked at what were the problems in health, how do we change it, and a policy was put in place, and it was systematic, and there was a performance contract all the way from the principal secretary all the way to the ground. And it was done uh, slowly by slowly, and the effects, if you ever do a study of the improvements in health from the year uh, 2005 to 2013, just before devolution, the process was well thought out, clear, and uh, you know, not at once. Part of the problem we are having is um, these, um, uh, for instance, dissolution of NHIF and the, uh, for instance, for private, uh, actually not private, for all providers, how do you onboard them? Mm. When even NHIF itself had taken many years of doing a lot of, uh, you know, studies, they come and look at your facility, they give you a contract. What will happen to all these contracts? Even mm. if you say NHIF is gone and the social health authority is supposed to take over all those contracts, will they be the same contract? Will they have to again go and look at it, you see? Mm. So that suddenness, if in my view, I would actually have, if I wanted uh, in a few years time, there not to be NHIF, for instance, then you offboard it slowly as you are transitioning slowly. 
but this start stop seems to be you know what is favored and, uh, and that's why it runs into problems that's why people go when you um stop um the managed schemes um um whatever reasoning you use even countries like thailand have civil servant managed schemes within the social health uh, insurance you mm -hmm. see so it can't be that okay let's stop all of them and when uh, you know something is challenged then you you say but it's a social health scheme yeah. so i think um uh, the for me the speed um at which it is being implemented um is um generally not uh, consistent with historical changes but um sometimes it is uh, wait and, and wait see. and see but ideally what yeah. they are saying there's a transition clause for nhif yes. and uh, it's in october mm. that nhif will actually be defunct and in the social health uh, shif it was written that um, the contracts that nhif have will run until they run out and for instance the civil service scheme run until june so those are still working mm. until june and then after that then so we so will what, see. So yeah, yeah. I, I like that because I think the um, word on the street was NHIF is done. Uh, but it's certain elements and there is a phase out, right? But I like what you said and maybe uh, as a final point back to Dr. Gitao. I mean, you run your own facility. Uh, you were... Do you call it a beneficiary? Do you call uh, you had a contract with NHIF? You had a contract with different other insurance providers, right? I know we have talked about the concerns. Maybe talk about what you would like to see very specifically, and say these are what uh, this is what I'd like to see, or these are the solutions I would propose, right? So then, as we're going through this next phase, right, as we're looking at the different regulations, it's at the back of our minds. This is what we'll want to look out for, right? Okay. Yeah. Um. So from the provider's perspective, our our list of the things that we want to see start from the transition. Uh, remember, as it is NHIF. Um, it, between ourselves and NHIF, there's a lot of money owed to private um, facilities, to FBOs and even oh, to yes. government facilities. Mm. So from a provider perspective is um, how do they ensure that even with the transition that any um, any claims, mm. any outstanding claims are actually paid mm. uh, so that um, providers don't lose any money. Secondly, in terms again, in terms of the transition, uh, ensuring that the transition happens smoothly, so that uh, in terms we do not interfere with patient care, we do not interfere with the claims management uh, process, and also as they change the claims management process, we are not incurring other expenses, other expenses to buy line. other yeah. uh, to buy other machinery or other softwares Oof. to be able to support mm -hmm. um, movement into SHA. And uh, significantly also in terms of the benefits package, we do hope that the benefits package would actually go higher than what is uh, currently in the national scheme. Mm -hmm. Because remember, especially for the private uh, in uh, providers, most of them have invested a lot into offering care. For instance, if you're a dialysis unit, if tomorrow the government says they're not funding dialysis anymore, mm -hmm. it means people have to pay out of pocket, for instance, and uh, that really messes up in terms of your how you provide care to your patients um so and and finally in terms of the uh, setting up of the social health uh, authority we do hope that the various provisions including the dispute resolution uh, including the um, uh, including the claims quality and claims management unit i hope they'll be set up and set up on time yeah. because as it is what dr kigundo has mentioned in terms of the speed mm. within this period the government is intending to roll out this uh, SHA. Are you able to actually transition all the stuff into SHA? You are you able to set in the software? Are you able to run contracts? Mm. Are you able to um, um, uh, get enough money to pay for these services? So those are the challenges that I foresee that I hope they do have a good work plan mm. that is implementable. Ah, we hope so. It's a lot, eh? Yeah. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work because, you know, it's one thing to read it as a headline. It's one thing to, uh, again, we all buy into, not even buy, we are all behind the spirit of it, right? We want quality care for all, right? When they need it without, you know, uh, dipping into their pocket, financial hardship. But it's a lot. It's It's providers. It is, as you're saying, it is... 
governance it's timing it sounds like a big part of it it's timing and it's a phased out work plan that it says we're starting with this element then we're moving to this and there's also uh, also sorry public participation but there's involvement active community awareness you know different stakeholder awareness because where i sit i mean half of the things that you mention i i don't know <laughs> <laughs> and remember maybe to just chime in is yeah. um in terms of change management mm. remember you're building an organization mm. from scratch yeah and you're bringing in old some some of the old employees from nhif mm. you're bringing new employees so you're bringing in new structures new policies so new board so essentially even before people gel and before people you'll have people who are opposed as others who are actually yeah. moving with the dream so before you actually achieve cohesion within that organization for you to be able to implement smoothly it's going to take time a lot of time yeah. i mean you, people will start having issues they walk into the building no one has any idea yet their staff members right yeah. it's 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 well it sounds like it's <laughs> it's a lot <laughs> it's a lot dr kigondo any final word because it sounds like again we'll need multiple multiple <laughs> conversation dr gitao needs to come back and tell her tell us your perspective from your clinic as well but yeah. final word yeah at the end of the day um you in terms of healthcare and uh you want that when someone needs a service they uh get it at their probably nearest um uh or preferred uh facility and they do not go into uh financial distress as a result of seeking that service or they are not able to get the service as a result of not having the finances to take care of that and therefore um the packages for instance that will be the tariffs that are uh, put in by the social health insurance fund should be um acceptable to the patient and to the providers um a lot of times uh government um takes advantage of providers for the populace to be happy um and um we this is what we are trying to avoid ab initio and um we therefore as uh, for instance where i come from as the kenya medical association we have actually um created an observer group just to be giving guidance as it unfolds because i think it's the medical professionals as you have heard mm who have understood it and are also impacted both as patients and as providers so we are in a good position to actually give guidance to the same and we hope that um, the spirit is followed by the letter mm -hmm. so absolutely i like that last part the observer group i think will need weekly findings we report here what what we see because again all i can say it's a lot thank you so much dr gitao for being here and you're definitely coming back hopefully yeah thank <laughs> you thank you for hosting me i'll definitely come back thank you so much for joining us on the one health podcast my name is dr elizabeth gitao minor i am a medical doctor Uh, currently working as a health system specialist and also an entrepreneur within the healthcare sector. So what do a day in my life entail? Um, basically, a lot of my mornings are spent um, checking in with my two facilities. I, I am a franchisee of Equity Afia Upper Hill and also in Makongeni in Thika. So in the mornings, I will do the admin work, basically check the emails, uh, be able to sort out my employees, um, check if there are any payments to be done. Uh, after which, uh, I usually would uh, check um, in terms of my other duties, in terms of a consultant, so it will change from time to time. So if there are any projects to be done, whether it's admin work within the project or sometimes technical work, so I'll work on that uh, majority of the day. Uh, additionally, I support the Association of Private Hospitals, which involves basically setting up meetings for the hospitals, um, doing engagements with various government agencies and also non-governmental. So it will depend if I have a meeting um, within the day or not, um, and that's what I'll address. 
Um, again, additionally, I sit within the Medical Council, within the Disciplinary Committee. So it would depend, some weeks are spent sitting down listening to cases of uh, disciplinary within the healthcare sector. So my day is usually uh, not very predictable, but a lot of it's spent in meetings and also um, basically trying to uh, improve healthcare service delivery within the clinics. Mm -hmm.